how often are you going to uncover a diamond in the rough? Because th where's the rough anymore? Unless you're finding Jordan Mailata on Australia, where are you going to unearth these diamonds that nobody else can find? Everybody can find everybody now. Appreciate you streaming it, streaming on in on the Jacob Media YouTube channel for the Mac and Mac 365 show. Let's get an informed third voice in to get McMullen and myself up to speed here. Uh, he has been the lead columnist in town for damn close to a decade now. Always good to talk Eagles. No, no, other venues. I'll talk other things with him, but we'll stick to the birds today here with Mike Tuski from the Inquirer. Uh, Mike. Always like to ask this question in a locked time zone phrase. Today, today's date, the Philadelphia sports scene. Sixers are 3-0 over Toronto. Phillies hit yesterday, but a bit of disappointment so far. We have a hockey team here that we're not acknowledging in town. <laughs> Where did the Eagles fit into the Philly sports scene mix Seven days before, and Jay Wright too. Jay, Jay, I was just going to say, John Jody, you left out the big, yeah. the biggest yeah. story. Like, came on me. Sorry, yeah. I, yeah, I, quite, I was quite narrow focused the, on the four major teams right. and the I, professional teams. I apologize, <laughs> Jay Wright. I was going to say, oh, only in Philadelphia could the best coach in college basketball yeah. shock yeah. everybody by retiring, and it might be the third biggest story in and around the city. Um, that's only Philadelphia. Where do the Eagles fit in? The Eagles are always somewhere near the top. Um, and this is the NFL draft, which has become in some ways, dare I say, like close to the Super Bowl in terms of the draw that it has to fans um, and people who follow, you know, the, the 32 teams in the league. Um, so right at this moment, it probably feels like the Eagles are a bit of an afterthought in the wake of Jay's retirement and Joel's shot and Kyle Schorber's moonshot yesterday in Colorado. But rest assured, as the, the draft gets closer, they'll be at top of mind for everybody. Yeah, and it is interesting with Jay, as you mentioned. I mean, that guy is a coaching heavyweight, by far the best coach, I think, in, in Philadelphia over the past two decades. Um you know, but some people get into that Bill Nova talk. Is it really Philadelphia, Mike? You got to get past that hump. You know, um, uh, somebody somebody phrased it this way, John, and I think it's perfect. I forget who it was. I don't want to take credit for it. Villanova is not a Philadelphia school, but Villanova is a Philadelphia basketball program, and I think that's the way to the right way to frame it. Well, and they play at Wells Fargo Center, right. and the banners are at Wells Fargo Center. But yeah. I mean, and, and and still through it all, you have that coaching heavyweight and, you know, Hall of Famer and yeah, it gets lost in the shuffle. The Eagles are among it, which is this city's passion. So it's a little bit, as you mentioned, but the NFL has turned the draft into a mini Super Bowl, essentially when it comes to taking it from city to city and these, this time places like Cleveland last year, they can't bid on the Super Bowl, but they can get an NFL draft. Vegas is getting it this year. Um, you weren't there. Marcus was there. But uh, I assume you took in Howie uh, and, and just your general thoughts of, of, of where he went and anything surprised you, anything eye-opening to Mike Sealski. Or he's Nothing. been doing this too long. He's too good. Yeah, no, nothing really. I mean, I watched it. I read the transcript. This is Howie bobbing and weaving and – you know, I've been one of these people who's been saying it for a long time. Don't listen to what they say. Yeah. Watch what okay. they do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he got it. You guys, you know, the, the reporters and media members who were there asked all the right questions, particularly about what the trade with the Saints means and the accumulation of these picks, particularly with respect to Jalen Hurts. And, you know, he gave me the pat answer of we love Jalen Hurts and we believe in them. And that's all fine and good until Jalen Hurts, you know, completes 60% of his passes and, you know, throws a couple, you know, picks that uh, maybe another quarterback theoretically wouldn't throw. And they decide, you know what, we can do better in the draft next year. Um, so, you know, nothing really out of the ordinary that I saw from Howie yesterday. 
All right. Uh, I am intrigued by your stance on the upcoming NFL draft, Mike Sielski, that it's almost like Super Bowl light. John kind of hinted at his stance. I want to get yours. Why do you think that is? I think it's a combination of factors, Jody. I think, number one, and this gets undersold, I think the draft unites the two biggest sports in this country in a way that no other event does. Professional football and college football. You have fans are watching not just to find out if their favorite NFL team is going to draft a player who's going to lead them to the Super Bowl or help them win the Super Bowl. That's obviously the overriding factor, certainly in a market like Philadelphia. But we forget how wide and deep the fan bases are of the college teams that these guys are coming from. And, you know, the I think a lot of people, for instance, in Alabama watch the draft and say to themselves, oh, okay. Nick Saban had another four or five guys taken, another two or three guys in the first round. That can only help the Crimson Tide going forward because that reaffirms that Alabama is the place to be if you want to get picked high in the NFL draft. And so those two forces are, you know, I don't think we talk about that enough. And I think it's that those are huge. Um, I think everybody wants to be a general manager now. And because, That's- you know, and because the All 22 film. And college tape is available now to be seen by everyone. Uh, some of the mystery of the draft is gone, right? Like when the go back to when the Eagles drafted Donovan McNabb. Yeah, you might have watched Donovan McNabb play on Saturday afternoons at Syracuse, but you couldn't do a deep dive into him the way everybody's doing a deep dive into Kenny Pickett this year. Um, and in some ways, <laughs> the opinions of a layman might be just as valid as the opinions of a scouting director of an NFL team Um, because we're all seeing the same thing. So, you know, I think people like to play GM. They like to say, oh, it was smart for this team to take that quarterback at that time or here's the guy who's going to be the sleeper. And all of that intrigue just adds to um, the draw of the spectacle that is the draft. Your your take was my first take. That's exactly where I was going because – I've been around long enough. Uh, my buddy Dave T. Thomas used to put out a draft guide. And it was like Christmas. Talk about Christmas and the new, and compared to the Super Bowl. When I got my Dave T. Thomas draft guide in the mail, I, I would just like sit down for six straight hours and read for six straight hours. Why? I couldn't get that information anywhere else. But now with the expanse of technology and video and everybody's got a blog and a website and information and like, yeah, you could sit back at home and say, I know better than Howie Roseman. 20, 25 yeah. years ago, you didn't know better than the general manager of your team. You crossed your fingers. You uh, just looked up to the sky and prayed that he knew what he was doing. It is so changed in a period of time. That's why I think it's become almost Super Bowl-like. More so, your point about the college and the pro games coming together is good. John's point about them actually hosting it and being able to pull in 150, 200,000 over the course of a weekend is good. I tell you, it's because it's personal participation. People know better than Howie Roseman in this town. Well, yeah. they've always thought that. Yeah, yeah, and, and the other thing too, Jody, the one thing that kind of distinguishes it from the Super Bowl, right, is the Super Bowl is the primary sporting event in the country where people who aren't big football fans will watch, right, generally speaking. Yeah. You know, the draft is kind of the opposite. It is Christmas for everybody who really loves the sport and really thinks that they know it. And so that gets, you know, the audience is is vast, but in some ways it's even more passionate because it's it's all these people like us who think we know or want to know. And that adds to the the draw and the intrigue too. Yeah, and how he brought up an interesting, when he went on one of his tangents, he brought up Ryan Grigson. Uh, who's an ex-personnel guy here, now out in Minnesota, talking about Andy Studebaker. Uh, if you remember him, Mike, he brought in a, a disc of Andy Studebaker. How he's like, nobody knew this guy. Nobody knew who this guy was. Now, you know, it would have been nice if Andy turned into a great player, but right. you don't have that anymore. Like, he said, whoever we pick in the third round, you're going to know who that is. Everybody knows who these players, so we're in the information age. Um, do you think that has shifted the difficulty of the draft? The fact that everybody knows these players, the fact that, um, there's so much, uh, 
there's so much of a microscope on things, group think, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of, is it tougher to go out of the box for one of these small school players that maybe aren't quite as known as those Alabama guys, Georgia guys, SEC guys? Does that make it a little bit more difficult? I think it probably does, John, because what you're talking about is thin slicing the evaluations of these guys. You know, you start to look at things that are so small. Um, you know, and try to read their character or their work ethic or their background, or it's this one thing that they did or said in the interview, you know, that I think that's probably part of the reason that for all the, you know, lighthearted ridicule and mocking that, that the Eagles and Nick Sirianni have taken for some of the measures that they use in their draft interviews, um, <laughs> that, that those sort of things, they feel like they have to do them because if, if everybody's got access to all the same information, how often are you going to uncover a diamond in the rough? Because th where's the rough anymore? Unless you're finding Jordan Mailata on Australia, where are you going to unearth these diamonds that nobody else can find? Everybody can find everybody now. I mean, how long did it take for Carson Wentz in 2016 to go from a really good Division I AA quarterback to being a guy who people whose opinions count in these things were saying, this guy could be the number one pick in the draft. Like that was, it was meteoric in every sense of the word. And it was suddenly because everybody had access to Wentz's college tape and everybody kind of came to the same conclusion. 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier, 20 years earlier, that would have been a completely different situation. Um, you know, the, if the Eagles had, had traded up to pick a guy from North Dakota State, kind of out of the blue, it would have been looked at like, what the hell are they doing? But nobody looked at it that way because everybody could see Wentz's tape and everybody kind of agreed, boy, he has a chance to be a really good prospect, you know, the last few years notwithstanding. <laughs> this week, we know the pressure is squarely on Howie Roseman's shoulders, despite the fact that the Eagles tell us every single year it's a collaborative effort. Although Jeff Laurie says he's doing less than he used to do. All right, we'll see. He's only involved with three picks over 25 yes. years, Jody. And damn, he was good on all three of those picks. <laughs> um, but they're leaning on the coaching staff second year rather than first year. But we all know this is Howie's time of year. He's going to either get a lot of credit for it or get a lot of grief for it one way or the other a year or two down the line. Uh, Jonathan Gannon, second year coach, he was up in front of the media answering questions yesterday. He's just as uh, devoted to defense as he is to offense. He's the head coach now. A guy who I think there's a lot of pressure on coming into this year is their defense coordinator, Jonathan Gannon, who Howie Roseman said, we're just renting him because he's going to get a head coaching job somewhere else soon enough. I had uh, one interview with Houston this year. The reason I think that's the case is he has to use the Eagles' best free agent off-season uh, off acquisition just perfectly. Because he is kind of a tweener. Is he a down defensive lineman? Is he an outside linebacker? How is this on Reddick going to be used? Uh, I know you heard it yesterday. We referred to it earlier on the show. Eagles good at safety. They've got Andre Sachere. <laughs> so they're just fine at safety. Or that's the painting, that how, uh, the picture that we trying to paint yesterday. They need to find a safety and what kind of a safety is going to be. There's some serious pressure on uh, uh, the Eagles defense coordinator, Coach Gannon, coming into this year. Is he up to the task, Mike? I don't think he was as bad as, every, as certain people made him out to be uh, last year. And I think if you look at the accent of what, they're, what they've done in this offseason and what they're probably going to do, I think that reaffirms it. Look, they're not good at safety. And they're, you know, they weren't great last year and they're worse now for Rodney McLeod not being around. Um, you know, there's a reason they went out and got Hassan Reddick. It's because their pass rush wasn't very good. And, you know, if you're Jonathan Gannon, you can only make so much chicken salad out of chicken you know what. And um, that doesn't mean he was perfect. Um, but it does mean that, look, if, if you're going to evaluate Jonathan Gannon just on what he does with Hassan Reddick, um, you know, that's, that's a, that's a tough standard to kind of meet. Um, you know, I, the Eagles are interesting to me because anything, any kind of argument you have about them, any kind of <clears throat> observation you try to make based on last year can be counteracted, right? Like 
Yeah, they got they got better in the second half of the year and they made the playoffs. Yeah, but look at the caliber of their competition. Um, Jonathan Gannon was too passive and and didn't blitz enough. Yeah, but look at his personnel. You know, would you blitz and take chances with the the eleven that he was rolling out there pretty much every week? Yeah, Jalen Hurts. Um, you know, had a pretty good season and got them to the playoffs and makes key winning plays. Yeah, but look at him in the Tampa Bay playoff game. So um, there's a pressure. There's pressure on a lot of people here, Jody, and I don't think. It's necessarily fair to judge Gannon um, until we get a full sense of what his personnel are and how he can fully deploy them. If he wants to, co- if if they are, if their personnel is significantly better on defense and they're still playing the same kind of schemes that they played last season, all right, then we can take a hard look at Gannon. But I got to think that some of what he was doing last year is taking a look around and saying, you know, I got to staunch the bleeding as much as I can because most of the guys I have on this defense can't play. Yeah, fair point, Mike. Um, I want to talk about one of the themes of this offseason that's been for the Eagles, really you know, amongst the fan base, and that is uh, missing out on players. And that's the perception. The Eagles push back on this behind the scenes. And if you look at the individual situations, it makes sense. You know, Russell Wilson didn't want to come to the East Coast. Deshaun Watson didn't want to mess with uh, Jalen Hurts' opportunity is the reporting there. They they got close uh, in the offseason working with Quincy Avery. Kirsten Kirk got $19 million. The Eagles said, all right, Godspeed. Um, Marcus Williams at safety, as you point out. Don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. They were in on Marcus Williams. Got $14 million. They said, Godspeed again. Um Allen Robinson wanted to go play with the Super Bowl champions. Robert Woods decided he wanted to play with the number one seed in the AFC. Each individual case, there's there's an explanation, and it's a good one, to be honest. For the most part, I agree with the Eagles. But then you got the bigger picture. You keep missing out on players. You miss, you miss, you miss, you miss, you miss. Does it become a self-fulfilling prophecy if you're too disciplined? If you're, we've been through this with with the Sixers to a larger degree. If I'd like to call it the "we're not ready" crowd, you get this whole "we're not ready." When are you ready? When is there ever a perfect moment? So, sort of that theme of the Eagles missing out on players. You think it's real? You think it's manufactured? In between. I think it's real to a degree. Um, you know, you think about uh, something uh, to, to take things in a, into one of Jody's favorite realms, baseball. Um, you think about something that Andrew Friedman, uh, I believe he's with the Dodgers now still, uh, general manager has been around for a little while, you know, really forward thinking guy once said, which is if you're too disciplined, I'm paraphrasing, but if you're too disciplined in your spending, you'll end up finishing third in every race for every free agent, right? At some point you have to shell out money. And I think there's, there's a lot of truth to that. Sometimes you have to overpay. I think circumstances matter. And I think one of the, the dynamics that's at play here is the perception of where a team is in its rebuilding or its place or status within the league, particularly with respect to the quarterback position. I'll give you a quick example of what I mean. During the summer of 2017, after the Eagles had signed Alshon Jeffrey, um, and this is going to be really ironic for people who follow the Eagles closely. I went down to um, Orangeburg and St. Matthew, South Carolina to do a deep story about Alshon. And I had lunch one day with his brother, Charles. And I'm talking to him about why Alshon decided to sign with Philadelphia, with Philadelphia, with the Eagles. And one of the things that Charles told me was, um, you know, he, he thinks he can win a Super Bowl like now, especially mm-hmm. because of the quarterback they just they just got. Yeah. You know, yep. now think about that in the context of what happened between Alshon Jeffrey and Carson Wentz. <laughs> but at that time, that was the perception of the Eagles was they had moved up to get a young up and coming quarterback. He had just played all 16 games of his rookie season and had looked, you know, inconsistent, but pretty good. And they were the hot new thing. And certainly, I think that helped them that offseason to sign some of the veterans they signed, whether it was Alshon, whether it was Torrey Smith, uh, maybe Chris Long, you know, players like that who went on, LeGarrette Blount, who went on and made a difference and helped them in the Super Bowl run. So I think that those kinds of perceptions are real 
but they are quick and they're fleeting. And I don't think that the Eagles are one of those teams that is perceived right now to be a hot place to be. Um, and some of that is Jalen Hurts. Some of that is what is, is the residue of what happened with the, the falling out and the exit of Carson Wentz. Um, but it's just not where they are right now. And I think that probably is a factor, at least for certain offensive players. Can't speak, you know, it's probably uh, thinner gruel when it comes to defensive players signing here. But certainly on offense, I think that's probably a, a factor is, you know, they're not completely committed to Jalen Hurts. You know, around the league, we're not sure that Jalen Hurts is really the guy yet. He hasn't really proved it. So do you really want to go there and take that chance? Funny how uh, Andrew Friedman said what he did about every once in a while, you just got to jump in the deep end of the pool. He didn't wait until he got to the Dodgers, who had the capability right. of jumping <laughs> exactly. into the yeah. He never said that when he was in Tampa. Yeah. He in, in Tampa, that in, to himself. Right. Yeah. In Tampa, the deep end of the pool was only three feet. In, in <laughs> Los Angeles, it's it's 12 feet. Yeah, you yeah. better jump in, not dive in. You crack your skull on the uh, <laughs> on the bottom of the pool at three feet. Um, I tying in with what you were just talking about, Eagles and perception around the league. Uh, this past off season, this off season we're in. I think the Eagles have lost out on a couple of players because, specifically, wide receivers. They saw what the Eagles did in the second half of last year. Run dominant team. Jalen Hurts only threw it X amount of times a game. Do I really want to go there? Am I going to get my numbers, my catches, my yards? They'll probably come into this season. I know they're going to come in, going to try and throw it more. How much more we're going to have to wait and see and find out. There's the possibility that they could do that all preseason, the first four, five, six, seven, eight, nine games, halfway point of the season. That's when they change. I would say it was more the fact that they let Derek Carr pick them apart than anything else, but they knew they had to do something different. They decided to turn to the run and it worked for them. Are they going to be more or less stringent about the way of winning football in the national football league in 2022 is to air it out? Or will they once again go, Hey, we got to do what we do best. And with our five guys up front, their ability to run block, we got to go back to that again. You're saying later, if not at all, this upcoming year? I am saying the Eagles have been upfront about how they want to play offensive football for the better part of two decades. And they only resort to the kind of offense that we saw last season when they feel like they have to, when they are desperate. They don't want to play that way. I wrote a column about this after they uh, they gashed the Detroit Lions 44 to 6 and Hurts threw about 15 passes. And I remember coming on with you guys, and John and I talked about this, about how that this was all fine and good, but this is not the way they want to play. They don't believe in it. Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman have been upfront about this. They want a quarterback who can be the center of their offense. They want a quarterback, honestly, in part, who can be the center of their franchise. This is a money-making thing. And this is a dynamic, I feel like, too, that, that people forget about with respect to the NFL. It's not just that the league set up the rules to allow quarterbacks to make things easier to throw the ball and make things easier for quarterbacks um, to keep their stars around and have them not get hurt so that there's more points and it's more entertainment. Quarterbacks are the stars. Quarterbacks sell merchandise. Th these teams want to make money, and one of the big ways to make money is to have a star quarterback. It is not to, you know, grind teams in the dust by handing the ball to Jordan Howard and Miles Sanders and Kenny Gainwell. And th those the Eagles don't want to play that way if they don't have to. And I think they are going to go into this season saying to themselves, we're going to do everything we possibly can to – to give Jalen Hurts the opportunity to show us he can play that way. And if he shows us he can't, we're going to go draft a quarterback. I, I don't see how anybody could see this any other way. I agree, Mike. And at, at some point, that's going to creep into the thinking of Jalen Hurts. We all act like Jalen Hurts is not affected by this because, for the most part, he comes across like that. He comes across as a really well-grounded uh, person who just comes to work, puts his head down, I think we all appreciate the work ethic that he provides. But at some point, no matter how many times the microphone shows up and the Eagles say, we love Jalen Hurts, we love Jalen Hurts, you mentioned it before in this interview. Don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. That trade was a clear indication that there's a big neon safety net under Jalen Hurts, and everybody can see it. 
including Jalen Hurts, at some point, um, do the Eagles have to stop this? Does it end next year? Can it possibly go past? We're talking this time next year in 12 months about the draft. Eagles don't take a quarterback. Can they go another year with this? Is it a never-ending, I don't want to call it Sixers cycle, but purgatory, stasis, how long can they take this? I would be surprised if they took it very long, John. Um, again, going back and looking at their history, they like to, to find a quarterback. Um, they don't mind, I, I don't think, if they stumble into one, you know, and I think that's what this year is for. It's to give Jalen this one last chance to show that he can stick, right? Like the, the difference between uh, a first round pick, a quarterback who's a first round pick and a quarterback who's a second or third round pick is that the first round pick has to prove to the team that he can't play. And the second or third round pick has to prove that he can. And that's Jalen Hurts. He has to prove that he can play. So they're going to give him this year. Go back to the aftermath, for instance, of the 2013 season. You know, my colleague Jeff McClain mentioned the, the 2013 draft in the meeting with Howie yesterday and the similarities between that draft and this one. Well, there's another big similarity. The situation at quarterback for the Eagles was a little unsettled at that time, except the difference then was that I was in the combine. I was at the combine, the 2014 combine, and that was the Eagles coming off of having gone to the playoffs in Chip Kelly's first season and Nick Foles throwing 27 touchdown passes and two interceptions. And if you asked Howie at that combine about the quarterback situation, his response was, we love Nick Foles. We think he has a chance to be terrific. He's our guy. We're going to do everything we can to help him succeed. And then the 2014 season happened. He got injured midway through. He hadn't been playing that well anyway, but they'd been winning. And then he gets, you know, Chip Kelly takes over and he trades Foles for Sam Bradford. And, and the whole idea of how he's playing gets thrown out the window. Okay. It's a different scenario this year. You're not hearing them. They're not acting as if Jalen Hurts is the guy that they think is going to stick. They're holding out for the possibility that he won't. And I think they want to get that position settled as quickly as they possibly can. So to answer your question, I would be surprised if they extended another year, if they franchise him or, you know, don't extend him and give him another year to try to show that he can't do it. They want to be settled at that position. And if Hertz doesn't prove that he, to them that he's the guy, I would think they're going to go out and draft one next year. They're saying one thing and whispering sweet nothings in other people's ears. I exactly uh, agree with you, Mike. All right. Uh, since you seem like you had a pretty good gas grasp on Howie Roseman and what the organization really wants, I'm going to make you Howie Roseman and give you a best case scenario, kind of like what you were talking about as well. well first of all, let's get let's get Jeff on here so that I can make bad jokes and needle him a little bit during oh, his yeah. press conferences. Not on yeah. goal. Very good. Uh, Howie yeah, always goes for the no, joke. It no, never no, lands. No. But didn't the coach and the general manager seem like they were boys yesterday? More so than ever with Doug. Howie and Doug, they had a good relationship, but it seems like uh, Howie and uh, Sirianni are going out for beers and wings after they had their media <laughs> session yesterday. Just Yes, uh, but, but Nick Sirianni hasn't won a Super Bowl, and he didn't make the play calls that led to them beating the New England Patriots yeah. and Tom Brady and Bill Very Belichick. But, you know. but uh, do you agree or disagree with my staff? They see more boys than Doug and Howie ever seen boys. Yeah, that's true. But I also think Doug felt like I won a Super Bowl. I wrote a book. You know, I should have, you know, I mean, let let's be honest about why he isn't there anymore. He wanted some say so and the Eagles weren't willing to give it to him. Right. I'm not making a yeah. statement on whether it's right or wrong. I'm right. Just doing no, you're, you're right, though. Yeah, yeah definitely. They feel that way. All right. So you're Howie Roseman. You can suck up to your coach or boy up with your coach as much as you feel necessary. All five wide receivers that are considered to be first-round draft picks in this upcoming draft are available. For some reason, no one takes a wide receiver in the first 14 picks, and the Eagles have their choice of any of them. What order would you put those five wide receivers in? Williams, Wilson, Alave, London, Burks. You got a Mike Sealski rating for us there, Howie Roseman? I don't. I'm closing my eyes and I'm putting my finger down and whatever name I hit, I hit. Um, look, there's no, I, I'm not a draft Nick, Jody. I'm just not. Um, okay. 
I, I approach the draft, honestly, I approach the draft the same way that, that I do the NCAA tournament. You know, people ask me if I fill out a bracket uh, come March, and I don't because nobody knows anything. You know, they, they really, they think they know. It's, it's, I go back to Jim Mora. You think you know, but you don't know. And I, I honestly, I don't know. I mean, I, I liked the Devontae Smith pick last year because I, I had seen him play, you know, for Alabama. And I thought it doesn't matter that, he, that he's pretty small or skinny or whatever he was. That kid just looks like he can play. But that's the extent of, I, I'm, not, I'm not breaking down tape to the degree that these coaches or the, or the, the people who cover the team and cover the league uh, do. Um, I just don't, and I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not. So you're, you're Howie Roseman. Now we won't take a shot at, at Howie. Mike Sealski at Mike Sealski inquire.com. Read him there. Obviously Kobe Bryant and the pursuit of immortality, the rise. You can buy the book, the rise of Kobe book.com. You can get it there. Mike, last question for me. I'll bring the Sixers back into it because they're making the run. They're 3-0. Tyrese Maxey has turned into quite the player. I think it's ironic. I've always talked about player development in the Sixers. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They couldn't develop guys. All of a sudden, all this losing, all these people at the top, obviously Joel worked out, but Ben Simmons we know, Markel Bolts not so much. Here comes the, I think it was the 21st pick in the draft. Tyrese Maxey turns into a player. You've got to hit on, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, John. We'll put the Eagles 10 on it. And then you, you, you can go any way you want to it. Sure. But I'm putting Devontae Smith aside because he's a top 10 pick. Do you see a Tyrese Maxey on, on the Eagles? A guy's going to come out of nowhere and develop into a star player. I would say the closest thing is probably Quez Watkins um, that they have, you know, six round pick showed flashes, certainly has plenty of speed, um, you know, showed signs of being a bit of a playmaker last year. Um, and and it's, it's a, it's a good analogy, I think, John, because teams that win consistently find guys like that, right? Like, the San Antonio Spurs don't have a dynasty just because they happen to get the number one overall pick and in the, in the year to get it and get Tim Duncan. Yeah. They, they find Tony Parker and they, they draft Manu Ginobili in the second round and they draft Kawhi Leonard late in the first round. You know, none of those guys were lottery picks. Nope. And, and I totally get the, the logic of, you know, hey, if you're not going to be good, be really bad so that you have a better shot at getting a great player like an Embiid or, you know, a year that a, a can't miss quarterback is available. Trevor Lawrence, Andrew Luck, Peyton Manning, somebody like that. Totally get it. But you, you have to kind of stumble or be smart enough to make picks like a Maxi, you know, like a potentially a Quez Watkins, you know, Antonio Brown for all his nutty behavior, Six six round pick, you know? And so you have to have those happen. And I would say, with respect to the Eagles, looking at that roster right now, you know, you got either, I would say either Watkins or Jordan Maialata are, are the two that stand out to me. Yeah, Maialata, not too shabby. Uh, Mikey, Mike, we're running late. We appreciate you coming on with us, whatever you do. We'll get you back on in a couple of weeks. Thanks for joining us today. Enjoy the draft on Thursday, bud. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. That is Mike Sielski, uh, the lead columnist here in Philadelphia, has been for quite some time. Always good to get him on to talk birds. Yeah, like Johnny said, you talk Sixers or Phillies or whatever, you get Sealski. You want to talk to him about a bunch of different things, but we are Birds 365, so that's why we stuck to the Eagles for the most part. We'll come back and put a bow on the show here on Birds 365. 